right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. So today's a special program in a number of ways. For one, we are broadcasting both to the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants channel and to the Toronto Zoo's YouTube channel. So welcome in to our huge array of people joining in on both. It's such a thrill having you join us from across North America and beyond as we celebrate such cool people and places uh, on this program. Program. Another note, because there are so, so many of you today, we have some live classes that we're going to take questions from later, but for anyone who's tuning in on YouTube, there's going to be too many questions to monitor in the YouTube chat bar, and so we have a workaround. If you go to slido.com and use the event code ZOO, you can share your questions there, upvote your favorites, and take part in a few interactive polls and quizzes. So head to slido.com, event code ZOO, it's a nice way to participate throughout the broadcast. So today we are joined live by the team at the Zoo. We have done over 30 programs with them over the last year now. It's been an incredible array of stories of animals of all kinds, featuring conservation stories, uh, animals from every continent and beyond. Such a good time. They're all on our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. But today we're going in with one of the most iconic animals of all, certainly uh, the, the apex land predator on this planet, which is the polar bear. So we are joined live by Mary Ellen and the amazing Toronto Zoo team at the zoo, live with the polar bears. I'm going to turn it over to them. And without further ado, guys, take Take us away. Thanks so much. Hi guys. My name is Courtney and I'm one of our zookeepers here at the Toronto Zoo. And with us today we have Hudson and Humphrey. They're just behind me in our polar bear exhibit. And right now they are uh, having a little bit of a play session. Uh, they're kind of what we call uh, sparring, but they're really just play fighting. Uh, it is getting close to polar bear breeding season right now. So occasionally they'll pretend to fight, but they're just acting like brothers and kind of wrestling with one another. They're not doing anything too dangerous or too mean. So you might hear a bit of growling for them. You might see some teeth, but that's just them playing. So these guys are eight and six. Nope, that's a lie. They are going to be 10 and eight this year. They're older than I thought they were. Um, and right now they're giving you a really good show of a bunch of polar bear behaviors. So. Humphrey's rubbing himself in the snow there. He's going to do that to cool down. But also, if he was wet, he'd do that to dry off. He's going to play with some sticks. They're showing off for you guys. They like to have some visitors. So they're really happy to kind of have us out here and watching them too. So these guys are our two boys. And we also have a couple of girls here as well. So we have their younger sister. Her name's Juno. She's six years old. She's over in one of our other exhibits. She's having a nap right now. She got a nice big rack of ribs this morning. So she is snoozing right now, kind of sleeping off that big feast. And then we have our two older girls, Aurora and Nikita. Aurora is the mom of all three of our younger bears. And Nikita is her twin sister. And those guys are going to be 21 this year, which is pretty old for polar bears. Polar bears generally can live in the wild to around 15, um, but in captivity, they can live well into their 30s. So 20 is not too old for them, but compared to a wild bear, they're quite old. Um, our boys here would be considered kind of middle-aged almost if they were out in the wild, but because we're not there, we can uh, have them live here for a lot longer. And the reason animals live a lot longer in captivity than out in the wild is because it's a lot easier for them here. They have vets to help take care of them if they get sick. They also have a great nutrition team, which helps to make sure they're nice and healthy. And we'll meet some of those guys later. And as well as they don't have to worry about where their food's coming from or any predators. So they kind of have a nice cushy life here. They get to hang out, play, eat all they want to eat, and just kind of have a nice and simple time, which is great for them. But these guys are also really great for you guys because this way with them in the zoo, you get to learn all about them and we get to kind of build up that relationship so you guys can see how impressive they are, how cool they are, and how great it is to help protect them uh, here in captivity, but also out in the wild. Now these guys, they eat a lot of food. They're our largest land carnivore. And right now they're pretty heavy. So Hudson over there, he's the one taking a drink of water from our water bowl kind of off on the one side of the screen. He is 550 kilos. So that is well over a thousand pounds. He's pretty heavy. He's a very good sized male. Males can even get bigger than that if they uh, had, you know, a lot of muscle, if they got some really, really good food out in the wild. 
Um, and then Humphrey, his brother, he's still growing. He's kind of little. He's only about 470 kilos. So that's about 900 pounds. That's still really, really big. Uh, the girls, on the other hand, they're a bit smaller. They are around the 350 kilo mark. So that's just around six to 700 pounds. And they're a good size. Females don't usually get as large as the boys. And that is because it's a lot of work to be that big. It takes a lot of food. And females can really want to be a bit smaller so they can kind of conserve their food as much as possible, especially because they're going to need all of their fat stores for raising their young. So like I said earlier, it is breeding season right now for our polar bears. So our boys are very interested in our girls. They're always checking out. Humphrey's over there trying to see where the girls went just to see if uh, anybody wants to come and say hi to him. Uh, but what they do is they would breed at this time of year, but they're not going to get pregnant right away. Instead, they're going to hold on to uh, any uh, babies that might be there for a long time. And once the fall hits, they'll actually uh, become pregnant then. And once uh, December hits and the snow comes in, uh, they're going to go out. They're going to build a nice den in the uh, snow and they're going to give birth to those cubs. Uh, generally, they can have anywhere up to four cubs, but one to two right now is about the average. Um, and when they're in there, uh, those cubs will be born. When they're born, they're only a couple inches long. They don't really have very much hair. Uh, so they stay nice and close and tucked into mom for about three months until they're big enough to go outside. So during this time, mom is in that den with them. She's not out hunting. She's hanging out with those cubs, which means that uh, she's surviving off of all the fat on her body. So for her to have a successful litter and to be able to raise those cubs big enough to teach them how to hunt, she has to actually eat enough the winter before to be able to sustain uh, herself going into the winter when she's going to have those babies. And then once those cubs are big enough, about three months old, she's going to bring them out. She's going to start teaching them how to hunt. And they're going to stay with mom for a couple of months until they're nice and big. And usually by the next winter, they're going to be ready to go off on their own. They won't be having babies yet. They're still pretty young, but they will be kind of exploring, maybe hanging out with their siblings a little bit longer and mom's gonna go off and do her own thing. <clears throat> now, like I said, we have five bears here in total, so feeding them is a lot of work. Right now, they are on their winter diet, which means they're eating a lot of food. So our boy bears get uh, about eight kilos, no, six kilos of meat right now, and they're also getting about three kilos of fish. And on top of that, they're getting fruits and veggies. These guys absolutely love lettuce, carrots, apples, uh, they also get a type of uh, dog chow that's specifically made for polar bears and they get a bunch of other treats. So they've got some melons. We have some frozen treats to throw them in a little bit to get their attention back over here. Uh, but we're going to give them a little bit of a break right now. We're going to let them kind of settle down from their fighting before we give them those treats. Uh, but we give them lots and lots of food every single day. But in summer, they're actually the opposite. So they're going to kind of stop eating once the summer months come. Instead, they're going to live more off of just fish and veggies, so they don't get too much meat in the summer. And that is because if they were out in the wild, they wouldn't have any ice to hunt on. So if they don't have ice, they're not gathering up that much food. Because in the wild, they're not necessarily going to be swimming after fish. They're a pretty fast swimmer, but a fish is a really hard thing to catch. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to hunt seal. So what they do is they go out on that sea ice, and if there's not already a hole in the ice, they're going to make one. And later on, I'll try and get Hudson to come over and pounce on the ice to show you just how they would do that in the wild. Uh, but they'd sit and they would wait for up to 12 hours for a seal to come out. And once they are kind of seeing that seal kind of stick its head up through that hole in the ice to get a breath of air, they're going to stick a big paw in there, pull it out, and then they're going to eat it. And the main thing they eat is the blubber layer on it because that is the fattiest bit, but it's also the most nutrients for them so they can make sure they get as big and as strong as possible. Uh, but in summer, when there's not that sea ice and there's no seals to eat, what they're going to do is they're going to eat other things. So they might eat fruits and berries. They might eat seaweed if it washes up. Uh, if they find a carcass or something, they might nibble at it. If they can get a fish or two, they'll do that. But for the most part in summer, they're actually fasting. So they're not really eating. They're kind of living off all of their fat stores that they've made all winter long. And they're just kind of holding out until the sea ice comes back in the next winter so that they can start eating lots of big meals again. So if you guys want to meet some of our nutrition experts here at the zoo, we've got two of them with us. So I'm going to introduce my friends, Yap and Sarah, and they're going to tell us all about nutrition and how our polar bears eat and all those sorts of things. 
So thank you, Courtney. <coughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Jaap Wensvoort. Uh, I'm the manager of uh, nutrition uh, and science here at Toronto Zoo. Uh, as Courtney uh, explained, you know, it's a polar bear is not really like a human. It actually eats very different in different times of the years. And it all got to do with ice. If there's ice, the polar bear can hunt and the polar bear can eat. But if there's no ice, they have to fast. And they're used to that. That's very normal for them. And, you know, that's nothing nothing really weird at all. So we're here at Toronto Zoo. We're trying to play into that uh, because, uh, you know, our job in Toronto Zoo is really to educate, but also to learn. And we always say to learn for the animals we're learning from. So we're learning for polar bears. And we find that very important because you know, we have colleagues like Dr. Peter Molnar, Dr. Greg Thiemann and more who are very, very supportive and know a lot about the real ecology of those polar bears and how it works. So years and years ago, I consulted with Peter and I consulted with Greg and we said, well, if we want to contribute at Toronto Zoo to a proper conservation research, we need to put those animals on a seasonal food supply. So we've actually done that now for many years and we are feeding them in the winter. Basically starts in end of January, February. We feed them lots and lots all the way into the end of May, June, mimicking their hunting period. And then from the summer, when it gets very, very hot, they get actually very, very little food and obviously they lose quite a lot of weight. And we want to know, you know, if, if that is the way to do, we want to know if a bear is what you say anabolic, which means it grows, or if a bear is catabolic, it means that the body weight goes down, how it looks, how their blood values uh, look. So we have been taking blood samples and trying to find out if actually the growing period is different than the uh, slow down period. And uh, we have found some differences that are very important and also that helps us to further understand uh, what the bear is doing in the wild. Now, another thing uh, what, uh, what's really important is that we do work very closely with Polar Bear International. Uh, we get lots of help from them. We talk with their experts and all that uh, communication is so we learn a lot about, about bears and uh, you know, we become able to give you guys some advice. Now, a few things we've done with those little bears. They used to be little bears. I was here when Hudson was born and Humphrey and Juno. And what we did with those guys is that we actually put them on a, what you call regimented diet. And that means that every week we would check how much they grew that week. And then we adjust their diet. And we did it in such a way that they would just eat everything. So that way we were able to find out a relationship between the growth of polar bear cups and their calorie supply. And you can imagine that's really, really important to know because it's all about survival. In the wild, energy supply, calorie supply, so to speak, is about survival. If they have enough, then they survive. If they don't have enough, they don't survive or they might not reproduce or they become very skinny and basically the population as a whole goes down. So that's why calorie supply is a main, main topic in polar bear research. And that's why we find it very, very important to know how fat those bears are at all times of the year. But Sarah will talk a little bit more about that. Now, the little bears, uh, we also managed with our veterinarians. So we have a phenomenal team of veterinarians, very skilled, helpful people. And without them, we certainly could not have done this work. Uh, they have helped us and also the vet techs to set up a protocol how to hunt rear polar bear cubs. And guess what? This protocol is gone around the world now. The whole world, uh, wherever there's polar bear babies born, they're getting the Toronto Zoo protocol for how best to hunt rear those babies. So that's another thing, contribution to, to conservation. Then another thing is that we actually like to know how fast they metabolize. It gets a little bit more difficult now. But basically, we need to know how fast is their engine running. And what we've done for a while is that we had, we have little eye buttons, very small little buttons they animals can eat and they 
comes out quite easily at the other end. They're very, very small, but they record the internal temperature. And the internal temperature of those bears is directly related to their metabolic uh, rate. That means how fast is their metabolic engine running. And we have already found out that, you know, that some very, very good results. But one specific thing I like to notify out of the summertime we did it because most people think those bears are too hot here in the summer. Well, we put those buttons in during the summer and it was very, very hot days and the bears do not overheat. We have proof of that. And you can also see, and they do that by way of behavior. So it's a behavioral adaptation. When it's very, very hot, uh, some of our colleagues actually call them carpets. They just lay in the field. They're, they're extremely boring for visitors, obviously, but they just lay there and they just conserve their body temperature. They're very well insulated and they absolutely do not overheat. So that's another thing we found out from our, from our work at Toronto Zoo. Um, so basically this whole uh, work here is, is uh, related to uh, SSPs and bear tags, which are worldwide organized and where we talk with our colleagues from other zoos, how to best uh, you know, give advice and how to best do certain things. So again, you know, this is not just a, an effort of Toronto Zoo or myself alone, but it is a joint effort with keepers, with vets, with uh, SS, uh, SSPs, with Polar Bear International, and obviously with the, both the University of York, uh, of York University and of, uh, of uh, UTC Peter, who will be later uh, talking to you guys. Basically, that's what I have to say. I'd like to give it over to Sarah now. Sarah will give a bit of an idea of, uh, like Sarah Gurley is my assistant and she has been working on how to further complete and, and do the future polar bear work at Toronto Zoo. And we just hope that you guys have some questions about that. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Sarah. I'm the supervisor of nutrition science and Courtney and Yap have really set me up great to be able to talk to you guys about our research programs here at Toronto Zoo. So as we've discussed, which there's two things that are really important to remember about polar bears. They have a seasonal diet. So they, there's times where they get really, really fat. And there's times where they, uh, they eat a lot of food and there's times where they, they don't eat a lot of food and they actually start to, to lose weight. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind as I, as I go through our research is their body fat is what allows them to survive. So they have a seasonal diet and when they get fat or when they're able to put on weight, that's absolutely crucial to their survival. So as you have said, we've had the polar bears here, all of our polar bears on a seasonal diet. Um, that's really, really important. And what we've been able to do is study the bears physiology. So what's happening inside of their bodies to allow them to gain weight and to lose weight. So what we've done uh, with huge amounts of collaboration with various researchers at UTSC, York University, with our entire veterinary team, our vet techs, and all of our amazing keepers, is we were able to train the bears for voluntary blood draws. And what that means is the bears are able to participate or they can decide not to participate in being able to um, collect blood. And what's really, really cool is that our amazing keepers have formed such strong relationships with the bears and using positive reinforcement, these bears can decide to give us their blood. Um, this allows them to participate not only in their own health, but also to allow us to understand what's happening when they're gaining weight and losing weight. So we're looking at a lot of different things in the blood. Part of the blood that we're looking at is hormones. So we're looking at a few hormones that, that help to control weight loss as well as appetite so basically what why does a polar bear eat we're wondering you know what exactly is happening in their brain and in their blood and their bodies that allow them to just decide right now i want to eat and i want to eat and i want to eat and then does that change when there are no seals around so what's exactly happening inside their body we, we can also look at the blood uh, for various different metabolites that can tell us what's happening with their kidneys tell us what's happening with their liver and it gives us clues, gives us an understanding of exactly how did these guys evolve um, in this amazing uh, environment that has, is very, very harsh, but only has a, a short period of plentiful food. 
Um, so that's one aspect of our seasonal program is that these bears are able to voluntarily provide blood and we get to understand kind of what's going on when we have a lot of calories and what's going on when we don't have a lot of calories. It's, and all that information can be used to better support the health of these guys here at the Toronto Zoo, but also allows researchers in the wild to have a better understanding of what's happening with a bear that they may have uh, in front of them out in the Arctic. That's really important. We don't, it, you know, we don't have so many bears that we know what a healthy cholesterol level is for a bear. We don't have enough bears to know that. So being able to gather that information here allows research to, researchers in the field to better understand what is a healthy bear, what is a not a healthy bear. Another really important part of the seasonal program is being able to understand how fat our, are our bears. You know, uh, you know exactly how fat are our bears. And you guys might have heard about various techniques uh, used in humans to de determine how fat uh, you are. You know, you can just get on a scale and that can tell you your body weight, but your body weight up is made up of bones and organs and a lot of water. Um, so we want to understand exactly how much fat, because if we can understand how much fat a bear has on its body, we can therefore predict how long it can go without eating. And as we know, as part of uh, climate change, those bears are getting shorter and shorter amounts of time to put on that weight that they need to survive. So we're working with various researchers to try to validate techniques that are used in the wild to predict how fat an animal is. Um, so one of the methods that we use um, is using um, morphometric measures. So that's looking at their morphology. So the size of their head, the length of their body, their girth. You look at how literally how wide they are. And of course we use also their body weight. So these measures um, in the field can sometimes be taken under uh, very uncontrolled circumstances uh, where the bears could be on a slope, um, could be curled under. So here at the Toronto Zoo, we have a lot of controlled environments that we can actually get very, very accurate and repeated measures on our bears. So what we do is that we, we have our bears trained to um, uh, be able to provide us their body weights regularly. Uh, we also have ways to try to train them to get their body length without having to anesthetize them. But whenever these guys have a health check that comes up, uh, we work with the vet team to coordinate um, us being able to come in and measure various parts of their body. Those measurements can be related um, to their body weight with a calculation that actually kind of spits out their percentage body weight. Uh, so sorry, percentage body fat. So that we know when these guys are at, uh, you know, in January at, uh, at a certain body weight, we can tell you they are, uh, you know, 20% body fat. What's really incredible is our bears over the season, our boys can put on t almost two, 200 pound, uh, kilos uh, of fat and it's 100% fat. Um, which is really honestly incredible. Our females put on around 100, 120 kilos of fat per year. And again, that's just out of that seasonal program. There's a couple of other techniques that we use to try to establish um, body fat um, on these bears. Um, so one of them is called BIA, bioelectrical impedance. It's used in, it's used in humans as well. Um, and basically, what it does is we shoot a, a tiny electric current through a bear when it's anesthetized. And it, um, what it's actually measuring when we do that is the total body water content. And why that's important is because water and fat can't exist in the same place. Uh, you know, you, you mix water and oil, they separate. Same thing for these guys. The principle is the same. We'll run the current through and we'll get a value back and, and we'll be able to use that resistance of the current to predict the total body water and then the total body fat. And it's much, much, it's very, very accurate compared to our ability just to weigh these guys and tell us, you know, uh, using the morphometrics exactly how fat they are. So that's sort of one way that we're using all of this information to, to validate techniques that are used in the wild. Um, all of the data that we collect, um, we, we work with various universities that they can integrate all of this data into um, models that help to predict polar bears survival. So it's really important that we are able to learn as much as we can from the polar bears here, um, again, for their own health, but also for conservation of polar bears in the wild.
All right, Jesse, I think that's all from our side here. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so, so much. So neat to hear so many perspectives on the polar bear. And what we're going to do now is go to Peter Molinar, who's been referenced, I think, 10 times over the course of the broadcast. He's joining from the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, which has a partnership with the zoo to really put on some really, really fantastic programs. You may have seen some of our other ones on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants channel, but I'm going to turn it over to Peter to blow our minds with all the cool stuff about polar bears in a changing climate. So Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, yeah, take us away. Your presentation's all good to go. We're all set. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation. Good to see Yap. Good to see Sarah. Uh, you know, after having been in lockdown for so long, this is really nice. Um, so, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about uh, what all this research means that Yap and Sarah have been telling you about, and and how this can actually inform us on what is going to be happening with polar bears as the climate change, uh, changes. And so first, of course, we're gonna note that, you know, as we've mentioned many times, polar bears need the sea ice, polar bears use the sea ice for all sorts of aspects of their lives. Um, there are bears that never leave the sea ice, they spend their entire lives on there, uh, move enormous distances, like some of them can move up to 600, cover up to 600,000 square kilometers in any given year. Um, they mate on the sea ice, they raise their young, they do all these things. But of course, you know, um, you don't need sea ice to do these things. What you need sea ice for is to access your food. Uh, polar bears, like every organism, needs to eat and basically get the energy that sustains them to go through their daily, daily lives. And polar bears have evolved over... Um, the years uh, to basically specialize on seals. And unfortunately, they're not good enough that they would be able to catch seals in open water. So if you have a scenario like on the right-hand side of the slide, um, the seal's going to get away every single time and the polar bear is going to get hungry. What the bears need to do instead is they need to basically use the sea ice as a platform to walk to where the seals are and the seals they are under the ice they're hunting um, but they still need to come up to breathe and when they come to these breathing holes like this little ring seal here is, is sticking its nose out then a polar bear knows that these are the spots to wait for the seals and if the seals are lucky it will get caught and eaten uh, same thing this thing here in the middle that you might be seeing um, that's that's a birth layer of seals so where the mother huddles down for months um, or for weeks to give birth to her pup. And again, the polar bear knows that they can sniff these out. They will approach them and then they basically stomp down on this thing. They crush the mother, they crush the uh, little one and again, have a meal. You can't do any of this if there's no ice, obviously. Um, again, because you can't, stop, uh, can't catch um, seals in open water. So, when we are talking about climate change, the big worry really comes down to this one thing. If you warm the planet, you're basically reducing the sea ice. It melts uh, sooner in summer. It comes back later in, 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 in the winter. And that basically means for polar bears that they have less access to their food. Um, and they have to fast for longer periods. And that basically means, you know, you have reduced energy stores, less fat to live off for the next period when you're looking for food. And if you are in bad body condition, well, if you're, you know, if you're just an adult male, the one in the picture here is a very, is, is one that's in extremely poor condition already. This guy's gonna run out of stores at so, uh, very soon and basically starve to death. Now, if you're a mother, um, before you starve yourself, you will probably stop sharing milk with your cubs. So again, it's the same problem. Now the cubs are not getting food and that in turn leads to their, you know, if you're lucky, then maybe you're just not gonna grow as big, but if you're unlucky, then the cubs gonna die. So now you put these two things together and basically, you know, you have reduced reproduction and increased mortality, that translates into having fewer polar bears around. When you, Turn on the news, you and, and you'll read about polar bears and climate change. You'll often also hear about things such as polar bears drowning because there's not enough ice to reach the next ice flow, or 
polar bears coming to town looking for food or even polar bears cannibalizing other polar bears to get some food. Um, it's important to know that at the end of the day, it's polar bears are excellent swimmers. It's not that they're all going to drown and that's what's going to lose the population. It's simply that when you're in bad body condition, you also can't swim that far. So again, to all these other effects I'm telling you about, you're adding also, well, you might drown, you might walk into a town and look for food and that in turn might get you killed, etc. So what I wanna do for maybe the next 10 minutes or so is I wanna give you a little bit of a more detailed idea of what the status of polar bears currently is and where we think they are headed if we are not taking decisive action on climate change. So this is a map of the North Pole on the, in the middle here, you have the, the pole, you're looking at the top of the world. And then in four different colors, you have four different eco regions that all differ in the ways that polar bears live a little bit. Um, if you look at the green one first, you have Hudson Bay here, uh, south of that is where we're sitting in Toronto, few thousand kilometers south of that. And this area is exactly as what Yap and Sarah have been talking about, that you're basically don't have uh, ice in the summer, but only in the winter, which means that the bears are forced ashore in the summer and there's not enough food for them. So when they're on shore, they have to fast. They have, live, have to live off all these fat reserves that they accumulated while they were actually on the ice and feeding. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about these other ones yet, except to say that um, there are differences in how long the ice disappears every summer. There are regions, particularly if you look close to the North Pole here, where the ice currently is there the entire year round, um, giving polar bears opportunities to eat entire year round. Um, but that's not going to stay like that forever. Now, if you look at the status of the current uh, polar bear populations, it's important to note that, you know, this is the Arctic that we're talking about. There are a whole bunch of areas that nobody has really gone and been able to do a, a, a comprehensive count of how many bears there are in each population. Particular, if you look at the red ones in, over in Russia, um, there just hasn't been a program in place to count bears. But um, in places where we do count them, what we are already seeing is that in several subpopulations marked with this downward red arrow, um, the bears are getting thinner, they're reproducing less, they're dying more, the populations are getting smaller. And there's a couple, or well, there's a few actually marked here in yellow that currently seem stable. And then there's only a couple of very small ones that were previously uh, overhunted and reduced to very low levels that are now recovering. But that's the current status. And what we're interested in talking about and finding out is what's going to happen to them in the future. And I really apologize if I'm showing some graphic pictures or, but at the end of the day, I think it's important that we um, that, that we understand that climate change, one of the victims that we will have are dying polar bears on the planet. When they first they get very thin and ultimately they will die. So what we tried to do is basically calculate um, how long can bears actually go without food? And how long will they have to go without food, given how much ice they will have in the future? So if you look at Western Hudson Bay, uh, circled there in green, uh, that's actually one of our best studied populations in the world. We have very, very good data from every year for the last 50 years or so. And uh, this graph, what it shows is the number of, or is, is the amount of ice that you have every day. And uh, what you see, first of all, is that, you know, on the left, you have winter, there's lots of ice, and then over summer, the ice goes down, stays down for something like 120 days, so three, four months, something like that, and then it goes back up again as the bay freezes over, and the polar bears can go back on the ice to feed. Now, if you group this by, uh, you know, look for, look 
successively in time, you look at the 1980s, that's the blue one. Then you look at the 1990s, that's the green one. Then the yellow for the 2000s and the red for 2010s. What you see is that there's less and less ice in summer. The fasting period gets longer and longer. And the time where the bears are on land to, uh, sorry, on the ice to feed gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So you have this double whammy that not only are you getting less food to get in really good condition, you also have to go for longer on the little um, food, uh, little stores that you have. Now, if we look into the future, how long will the bears actually have to fast in the future? We've done a bunch of projections. We've calculated the sea ice uh, basically until the end of the century um, for the different polar bear populations. And again, there's a lot of detail going on here, but all that you have to focus on is um, if you pick out any of these populations, you see three lines. You see the red line, which is the number of ice-free day net populations in the past until currently. And then you see two model projections for kind of a better case and a worst case scenario. And in all of these, the number of ice-free days increases dramatically, which basically means the polar bears have to go longer and longer without food. Now, The next thing we need to do is we need to calculate, well, okay, it's great that we know how long a bear has to go without food, but how long can they actually go without food? And I thought a lot about whether I'm going to actually throw in these equations. Uh, I don't mean to anyone sc scare anyone off, but given that we are talking to school classes today, I did want to point out, you know, when I was studying math back in high school, nobody told me what this stuff is good for. One thing it's good for is to calculate uh, how long bears can live if they don't have food. All that we do is calorie counting like we do in human diets. You basically calculate if you don't eat for a day, how much energy will you be losing? If you move around at a certain rate, if you uh, maybe have to give milk to your cubs, if you do all these things. And then you can take this bear, like, you know, here we start with a bear that's about 450 kilograms at the start of the fast, and it takes it about 270 days, so almost nine months until it starts to death. Um, they're really, really good at fasting, but every organism has its limit, limits. And now what you then do with these calculations is basically you calculate what we call fasting impact thresholds. The number of days that a polar bear population can go um, without any great problems due to fasting. And we looked at the various segments of the population. We looked at the adult males, we looked at the adult females, we looked at their cubs. And so you come up with this table, I'm just gonna draw your attention to a couple things here. Um, if you look at adult females with cubs, which is uh, boxed in in magenta, um, under the 0% column, which basically means the bears are about as fat as they used to be in the past, it takes 117 days until you see mothers not having enough milk for their cubs and then in consequence the cubs dying and all that stuff. Um, it's quite a long time, but still, after four months, tr trouble starts appearing. If you now go to the adult males, well, they last longer, they're big, they're large, but after 200 days, six months, you'll see, you'll start, six and a half months roughly, you'll start the first males starving to death. Not everyone, just one, two, and then cumulatively more and more. Now, I'm going, I think I'm actually going to spare you most of this, but what I do want to point out is that before we actually use these models, to go forward in time, to make any predictions. What we want to do is we want to look backwards in time. We want to make sure that our models are, you know, our fancy math, ma mathematical calculations, they actually capture what's going on in reality. So again, if you look at our Western Hudson Bay population, what we've seen over the years, um, well, just for that, what we've seen over the years on the left-hand side is that the bears are getting thinner and thinner. They're losing body mass. And again, that is because the ice is getting less and they're not getting that much time to eat. On the right-hand side, what you see, now let's just focus on one line here, that, that magenta line there. That's our fasting impact threshold. In the early 1980s, bears were fat. They could go for a long time. So the threshold is high, about 140 days. 
But then the bears get thinner and thinner, meaning they're less resilient. And by the year 2000, approximately, um, the fasting impact threshold is on the order of 120 days. And the black line shows how many days of fasting they actually have to do. So now they have to do more fasting than they're actually capable of doing. And what we actually see then is that at that point, um, cubs start not making it. Some of the very old and weak bears start having problems and the population declined by about 20% in the last 20 years as a consequence of that. And, you know, you can do this for all sorts of populations. I don't think I have the time to go into these details. So I'm just going to talk about the future for one second, where, again, we now try to match these fasting thresholds with how long the bears have to go. This is, this is the population in Greenland, and we have the ice uh, projected forward under kind of a worst case scenario. Uh, multiple model simulations, uh, you know, to, to, to control for random effects and all that stuff. But basically, this black line here shows, again, the number of fasting days that bears have to do. And then those magenta lines, again, are the fasting impact thresholds. You see, the longer we go into the future, the more and more thresholds we're surpassing, the more and more dire the situation gets. And... If you do this for every single population, um, or well, for 13 of the populations that I've shown you, you come up with this graph. And what you see here is on the left-hand side, again, I have 13 populations listed. On the top, we have Hudson, Western Hudson Bay, and Southern Hudson Bay, Davis Strait, all these other ones. On the right-hand side, I have a timeline, which we call timelines of risk. Um, for every population, you see colorful bars in magenta and blue and in red, and they relate to when will you see problems about reproduction, when will you see adult males dying, when will you see st uh, start seeing adult females dying. And when these bars first get crossed, so for example, in you know Western Hudson Bay in the year 2020, we have already see all, all we have already, sorry, we have already crossed all these colorful bars. There are problems in that population. If we go to some other populations, there are nothing yet. They're, they're all white yet, still at this moment. But the ice is increasing, impacts are coming, reproduction will decline. And frankly, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but if we continue basically uh, without mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change on the same trajectory as has, has been for a very long time. Then we are in a real danger of losing every single polar bear population on the planet, except maybe those in the Queen Elizabeth Island in the very north. The good news in this story is that if we actually take decisive action, you see there's still colorful lines, so it's not entirely a happy picture. There's still populations that we're going to lose. The southern ones are going to essentially transform into different types of ecosystems. But the northern ones have a very fair chance of survival. So it's really up to us how we treat the future, you know, for our own sake, as well as for the polar bear's sake. Um, I think I'm, I've spoken for long enough, so I, I'm going to leave it at that. This last slide, I really just said that if polar bears would have to go on land, they would be in real trouble because there's not enough food for them. So I'm going to thank you guys for having me and, of course, take any questions that you're interested in asking. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Peter. It's been a pleasure to get to hear uh, again. Thank you for talking from polar bears today, from the of the zoo, and from you and the, the research side of it. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is we're at the time that we typically end up the broadcast. So what I'm going to do is uh, we've got our live groups. I am going to come to all our live groups once if you guys are able to stick around. If you can't, let me know in the chat bar immediately, and I'll try and come to you as quick as possible, and we can take some more questions at the end. And I'll take a few from our Slido groups. We did end up with about a 1,000 kids from across the continent today. So welcome into all of you guys. Uh, uh, from I think 10 states, four provinces. It's been a really exciting time. So thanks for all showing up. Um, I'm going to bring us back to uh, Mary Ellen and the zoo team as well, but live at the polar bears. And what I'm going to do first is go to the green school joining us in Palm Beach in Florida. If you guys want to demute your mic and ask us the first question about polar bears, come on in and go for it. Hi, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Oh, just get that microphone, unmute it, and then you're good to go. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying. 
here from the Green School in Palm Beach, Florida. It's 90, 90 degrees outside. Sorry to rub it in. But I got some kids with questions. How many questions would you like us to ask? You can ask two if you'd like. Go for it. Okay, go so ahead. Come on up and ask your question, honey. So, um, so my first question is, what is the current percentage of well, polar bear survival? And how has the percentage of survival, um, what is the percentage of survival rate changed over the years? Yeah. So we'll bring in the zoo team if you guys want to answer that. And Peter, too, if you have a thought on that. But uh, zoo team, percentage of polar bear survival, how it's changed over the years. Both of you guys can chime in with that. I think we'll pass that one to Peter there. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. That's a really good question. And that has a really complicated answer. And I already spoke so much, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But what is important to, to recognize is that you have these 19 populations, and they're all different. Um, there are some that are doing very well right now, or at least as well as they used to in the past. But if you want to understand the future of polar bears, you're sort of looking where effects are happening first. And, you know, the south is the warmest. Those bears are already at the edge of their range. And those are the ones that are um, likely the first ones to be in trouble and already have gone into trouble. So typically what you need for a polar bear population to, um, to survive is basically adults, 96% of adults approximately living through every year. So out of 100 bears, if four adults die, that's okay, but more than that is a problem. Um, we have now in Hudson Bay, in the southern population, we have had declines. The exact number by how much percent the, 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 the survival has gone down, I can't tell you because I'd have to get into all sorts of numbers. But we know that the Hudson Bay population has declined by about 20%. It went from 1,200 bears to 800 bears. We know that a population in Alaska has gone from about 1,800 bears to 900 bears, so by, down by 50%. And again, there are others that are perfectly stable right now. Nothing's happening, but we expect things like that to come in the future too. Yeah, thanks. Sure, that was great. Um, all right, let's head to uh, Miss Lawrence's class uh, in the, the Savvy Sixes. Miss Lawrence, you want to unmute your mic? Go for it. Cool. So there you go. Go for it. I said, yes, sorry of my life these days. Um, okay, so we have a few questions right from, from the beginning. Um, is what challenges do be, uh, polar bears face? I think we've answered that, so we are going to skip that. How does seasonal diet work and why it is important? Um, and then another question is, do they lose their natural instincts because they're being fed by humans at the zoo? Yeah, good question. Our zoo team, you guys can handle that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, I can answer that question uh, on, the, on the seasonality of the bears. Uh, yes, it does work. You know, the simulation does work. They, uh, we measured, uh, they lose weight and they also change their, uh, their blood parameters. And we also think they uh, change their behavior. Uh, so yes, the, definitely a, a big yes. Excellent. And as for the question of, because they're in a zoo, do they lose some of their natural instincts? It depends on the bear, but usually no, they do still have that hunting instinct, that carnivore instinct in them. Uh, our bears are a little bit unique. Three of our young ones, they're all hand raised. So Hudson, our big, big guy, he doesn't necessarily know he's a polar bear. Uh, Humphrey and Juno, we kind of figured out by then. Hudson was the oldest, he was our firstborn. We kind of coddled him a little bit. He got really used to being human. He thinks he's a human. Uh, the other two, they know they're polar bears, so their polar bear instincts are very, very strong. Hudson sometimes forgets. That's why you kind of see him going towards the doors when uh, uh, we were doing the background footage of him. He was going seeing his keepers inside that were cleaning the house. Uh, whereas Humphrey is way more interested in the girls because he knows he's a polar bear, so he's trying to go see them as much as he can. Uh, but So their instincts are still there. We don't go in with them because they are so large, and we don't want to take a risk. Uh, but they are very friendly with us if they're in a good mood in the house and we have bars in between us, uh, but they are still polar bears. Yeah. Very, very cool, guys. As long as he doesn't learn how to like turn the latch and turn the doorknob, I think you're okay, but uh, we'll, we'll keep posted on that. Um, we're going to go to Mr. Reed's class, joining us in Stony Creek. Mr. Reed's kindergarten class, go for it. Well, hi. Uh, 
Hi, Jesse. It's uh, nice to uh, see you again. Uh, and we're uh, actually doing it live this time instead of doing it remotely. So say hi, everybody. Hey, guys. So nice say to hi, see you. Every- wave hi. over here. Look here. I like the face shield. You guys look awesome. Way to go. <laughs> so we had a lot of questions. We've been uh, exploring polar bears. And one question that they have is, um, like, when they're swimming, especially as they lose their body fat, do polar bears get cold in the water? Awesome. All right. Zuti, what do you guys think? So, uh, do they get cold? Depends. If you get a really, really skinny polar bear that has shed off most of its fat stores for the summer and it's getting into fall and winter and he's still in that water, it might get a little cold, but they have so much body fat that especially our zoo bears, they don't usually ever get skinny enough to get that cold. But on top of all that body fat, they also have really great hair for keeping them warm. So if you see our polar bears, they all look white and fluffy. They're not actually white. Their hair is actually clear. And then they've got black skin underneath. So that black skin will absorb the sun and keep them nice and warm. But that hair is clear and hollow. So they can trap nice warm air next to their bodies and keep them really, really cozy. So they're far warmer than we are at any point of the winter. And in the summer, they can use that trap cooler and keep themselves nice and cool. So other than maybe an odd circumstance where you have a bear with no body fat in winter, which I mean, these days might be more likely to happen with global warming and the decrease of our sea ice. Uh, but for most part, they should be warm all year round. Great question, guys. All right, I'm gonna take two quick questions from Slido. We had like 100 plus questions there as well, so thanks for all our YouTube groups. So Tala wants to know, do cubs have to leave their mom once in a while and go to any different places? Are they ever leaving their mom before they finally leave for good? So Peter, if you wanna answer that for us, come on in. Sure, Um, so cubs stay with their mother for about two and a half years. Um, They get milk for that time, but it's less and less and less. So, you know, the mom basically wants to make sure that the cub learns how to hunt and learns how to do things on their own. So in the beginning, it's a very tight group. Cub stays there, both mostly feeds on milk. And then the longer it goes, the more it gets taught how to feed, how to feed seals. If you take, take a two-year-old, it's going to wander off. It's going to hunt its own seals. It's going to come back. Maybe even share its seal with, with its own mom. It's like, look what I caught. Ultimately, the goal is after two and a half years, you should be on your own, no more milk, and you're getting kicked out of the family. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another quick question for you, Peter, and then we'll head to our last five class for zoo questions. The question is, how many bears are left in the wild or the zoos in the world? So the zoo team can probably speak more to how many polar bears there are in zoos. Uh, in the wild, it's hard to answer. Um, there's actually... There's debate around it. There's lots of estimates you'll see. It's somewhere on the order of 20 to 25,000 bears. The reason we don't know for sure is, you know, we don't have information on every population. We have no information on the Russian bears, for instance. We don't have no information on some of the Canadian bears. Um, But from what we know, it's fairly easy to say that there's somewhere between 20 and 25,000. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. And then Zoo Team, I don't know if you guys have an estimate of how many polar bears are in captivity in the world, but if you do, that'd be great. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how many there are. We have five here at the zoo. Assiniboine, which is out in Winnipeg, has 11. Wow. And then there are a whole lot of zoos down in the States that have a bunch of bears as well. So, I mean, we're probably looking at maybe max 100 in zoos, uh, but there's a lot over in Europe too, and I'm not sure about those. So. Yes. Not quite sure on that one. Polar bears everywhere. Well, great, good job. That's a great question for our team on, on Slido. I'm going to go to Mr. Shaddock's class first, and then Ms. Hoffs, you can finish this off in a minute. So Mr. Shaddock, 678, joining us in Chalk River in the classroom again. Hi, I would like to know how many species of polar bears there are. Yeah, so zoo team, how many different kinds of polar bears are for one? Oh, us? Uh, so there is only one species of polar bear. Even the ones that are over in Europe are the same kind of species as our North American ones. So pretty simple as far as polar bears go. Just the one guy, thanks guys. All right, and then Ms. Hoffs joining us at Winchester Public School. If you guys have a question, go for it. Hi, uh, that was really interesting having worked at the zoo myself to hear about the the metabolic rate research that YAP is doing and uh, some of the cool research that Peter shared. Um, I'm representing two schools, Broughton and Winchester in Whitby and grades two to eight tuning in. And uh, we had a bunch of questions. 
Um, but here's the one we're going to share today. Um, considering how many or how climate change is impacting the range of polar bears, are you guys seeing in your research any bear hybrid species that might be emerging? And how might that affect uh, future polar bear populations? Yeah, very cool. Well, I'll turn it to Peter for that one. Peter, if you want to answer about hybrids. Yeah, I. That's so, sort of the follow up on how many species there are. It's true, there's one polar bear species, but they also live right next to brown bears. And when I say next to, I should be more clear on that. The bears, uh, the brown bears are generally on land and the polar bears are generally on ice, but every once in a while they encounter one another. And we actually had, I don't know the exact number of cases, but some, two, three, four, where we know that a polar bear made it with a brown bear and, and uh, they had some sort of mixed offspring. Now, of course, this is gonna keep happening. And, and as the ranges change, there might be more contact, might be happening a little bit more than it has in the past. But given that, you know, given the massive changes we're expecting in the next 80 years or so, it's not like we're just gonna replace this with another species. There's going to be, um, the bigger, the, the bigger change are all the mortalities that we're going to see rather than hybrid species. Very cool question, guys. Though we don't often get hybrid questions, that's pretty neat. Um, what I want to do last to wrap us up before we end the broadcast is go to our zoo team and ask for the kids at home. We've got a thousand kids tuning in from across the continent. What can they do at home or in their classroom to help protect polar bears? We heard about all these threats the polar bears are facing. So if we've got uh, uh, kids at home that want to take action, what can they do? Uh, zoo team, if you guys can answer that, that would be fantastic. All right, guys. So for what you can do to help polar bears at home, there's actually a lot of things. So like we said, the biggest thing affecting polar bears really is climate change. So if you guys want to help fight climate change, there's lots of stuff you can do. You can carpool, you can turn down your thermostat at home, add an extra layer. You can, in summer, turn your um, heat down or your air conditioning down and be nice and a little bit warmer in your house. Have an extra popsicle, maybe go swimming instead. Uh, the other things you can do is the more trees we plant, the more carbon dioxide we pull from the air. And as a result, we help to kind of balance out our carbon footprint. So if you guys want to get out and plant trees and gardens in the spring, that's really, really helpful. Uh, other things that you can do right now, especially February is Polar Bear Awareness Month here at the zoo. And so we have on our Toronto Zoo Facebook page, as well as our TikTok and our Instagram, a whole bunch of different Toronto Zoo facts. We have some TikTok challenges that you can take part in. All of these things help to raise money for our polar bears, both here in the zoo and outside. And one more thing you can check out, which will give you lots more ideas and a lot of help, is check out our other zoo to you programs that we put on here at the Toronto Zoo. Those are a great method to figure out more things you can do to help out our polar bears and our other Arctic species. Fantastic. I always love ending with that message and it's so cool to get the chance to see polar bears today here but all sorts of amazing research being done on them. So what we do at the end of every broadcast guys for our classes and for our speakers I'm going to bring you all in and if everyone wants to join me in saying a big thank you and goodbye to our zoo team and to Peter today, our green school Mr. Shattuck, Miss Hopkins, team. Come on in guys, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.